Okay, so in our last exciting episode, we had JavaScript that was able to do a loop. We looked at a for loop on Tuesday. And we went through the idea of uh, the for statement and a variable, which could count the number of times you go through the for statement. Today I'd like to just mention briefly two of the concepts. One is called functions. Functions are a way of taking code and encapsulating it into a, a, a thing, and then just using that thing. Remember, we talked about software is difficult because there's so many moving parts. We just take a whole bunch of those parts and put them in a box, call a function, and you forget about it. Once you know that function works, it will always work. The second thing is the document object model. We talked about this in HTML the whole class. The, uh, the HTML page has a head, has a body, the body has headers and footers, blah, blah, blah. That's the document object model. We've also talked about cascading style sheets. What I'd like to talk about is changing this using JavaScript. Now your homework, assignment six, only it requires you to write a loop in JavaScript to make JavaScript spit out a loop, that's fine. Nobody ever pays you for work like that. The kind of work that people use JavaScript for is to make pages do things. So you've had HTML since the beginning of the class where the page comes down into the browser, the browser looks at the content of that HTML page, looks at the semantics and the structure, takes the, what, the style sheet, applies the style, and then displays the thing, and then it's done. It has rendered the page. From that point on, there, the interactivity we looked at was a form. The form had a button. When the button was pressed, the browser took that form and shipped it up to a Perl script somewhere. And that was the only interactivity that was ever built into basic HTML. To go beyond that, like most pages these days, you use JavaScript. So if you're going to be making any kind of modern web pages, you've got to use JavaScript. Just three or four years ago, people were cautioned to turn off JavaScript in their browsers. It was a security risk. Browsers have gotten much better since then, and they have better ways of defending themselves against um, malignant JavaScript. Now it's very rare to find a page that can do anything for you without having JavaScript turned on. For example, Google Maps. You guys ever use Google Maps or Bing Maps or, or MapQuest? I don't know, anyone who doesn't use Maps, if you're, if you're traveling around, especially if you're driving, all that is based on JavaScript. You can't do Maps without JavaScript. These days, if you're doing forms, you want to know whether the input on the form is correct. Remember validating forms? We did that in Access using the Access form structure. These days, you do it first at the form in the in the browser using JavaScript. You do it again at the database layer. So let's take a look at a simple chunk of JavaScript. There's two or three things that we're going to do with this page. So I'm going to turn on my big friend uh, Firebug. I love Firebug. Let's move Firebug over to the side. So now Firebug's over here. So on this side of the page is what is being rendered. Here's my code, here's my HTML, and my CSS, and my JavaScript. And then here's some additional information in this page. So let's take a look at First of all, let's take a look at the, at the uh, code itself. Can you guys read that? Let's switch back out to um, that plus plus. So the code is your typical XHTML. It's got some included styles. It's got a JavaScript thing. It's got a JavaScript external file. You've seen all of this lately. 
There's a couple of things in here that you'll see that are testing style sheets version 3, CSS 3. If you look at this um, in an older browser or an Internet Explorer, it won't look the same as in a, a modern browser that runs WebKit like or Safari. Namely, it's got these border radiuses. We used to spend a lot of time making curved borders. This thing, this border radius right here. Used to make that out of images. And you cut and slice little images and you put them in there. You don't care. It's just like anything in old code. Nobody cares about how hard it used to be because it's easy now. I worry. So, if we look at this same thing, however, in, wow. If we look at this same thing in, oh, I don't know, Internet Explorer. Wow, it's smart enough to know. Cool. So whatever version of Internet Explorer this is, what is this? This is So if you look at 7 or 8, you won't see the, the uh, curves. Okay, so there's a little bit of style up in the head. There's a little bit of style in the external style sheet. You've seen that before. You know what that is. Then there's a header one. And there's a page. Let's turn on the graph. Then there's this thing called the output area. It has an ID. Why am I using an ID instead of a class? Anybody know? What's the difference between an ID and a class? So an ID is unique. There's only one of them on the table. You can have many kinds of divs that are the same class. So this class, this is saying I want Everything with an ID of output area is going to have a border, and it's going to be padded, and it's going to have a big margin around it, and it's going to be gray, and it's going to be 600 pixels wide, and it's going to be curved around the board, and it's going to have a border radius. So this thing right here is that rounded gray rectangle. There it is. If I use my firebug and I say inspect element with firebug, inspect element with firebug. Then it goes right down to that div. You can see the gigantic margins I've got on it. I've got 40 pixels of margin. I've got big padding too. The purple is padding. And I've got a little bit of text in it. So the main reason I want to do this this way is so you can see that div. That's all. Let's keep looking at the code. There's a few other places. Here's a button. Here's a form. Look at that action. This is something you'll, you'll see in a page that relies heavily on JavaScript. What usually goes in the action of a form? What does an action contain? It's a URL to what? Anyone remember? There's a CGI script up on a server someplace, and that's where the action is supposed to point to. Well, this, this points to nothing. This action points basically to this page. But what it does have is in the input tag, it has this cool on-click attribute. This is a way of attaching a piece of code to a button. But what is this thing? The show confirm. Is it a function? Pardon me? The function. The function. You can tell it's a function because when we define functions, we have a name. This is the name of the black box, and then there's always a pair of parentheses. Sometimes there's stuff in the parentheses, but there's always parentheses. Let's go see if we can find this. Now, Notepad++ plus plus is great. If I select something, it highlights it in green. And it's not in here. Oh, there's an external JavaScript file. Let's go open that up. So this is a ch uh, chunk of 
JavaScript. The green stuff is all comments. You don't need to understand this. I want to just show you that the, this is one of the simplest functions. So there's a couple things here that I'd like to draw your attention to in a JavaScript function. And this is the same as like a C function or a Java function. There's a couple of things that you always see. You always see this in JavaScript. This says whatever follows from this point on is a function. This is a, a subroutine. This is a method. Here's the name. This is required. Any attributes you go in there. And then there's your open curly braces. Let's see where those are matched. Use, use your editor to find out where is this matched. Click on it. And it shows you that this whole thing down in here is the function. There's a couple of variables. I'm saying this is a variable. The name is result. And then I call this function. I call it another function. I call it that's built in. That's built into the JavaScript language. That's an example of a library. Remember we talked about a lot of people programming language comes with a library of stuff that other people have written for your wonderful use. You don't have to deal with it. This is an example of it. This thing pops up a window. We'll see that in a second. There's another example of using a library just below it. I've got another variable. This thing is calling a library. The library is called get element by ID. Now, do you remember that output area we were looking for? The output area was in over here. This was the ID of that big gray rectangle. I want to go change the contents of that big gray rectangle. So what I do is I go to JavaScript and I say, hey, talk to the document. And when you talk to the document, use this method, get element by an ID. I want to give you an ID. And that ID is output area. This is a critical concept. So I've named a piece of HTML output area. I put it in a div and I've given that div an ID. I've given it a name. Then in my code, I've gone along and I said, ask the document object model, ask the document to point to, to give me that place. And I'm going to take that place, that ID, and I'm going to put it in this variable. Now that I've got it in the variable, I can do anything. That's one of the cool things that we've talked about. We, we said, OK, I can put integers in variables. I can put strings in variables. One of the things that you can do with variables is you can put objects in them. You don't even know how they work. It's kind of a pointer. It's kind of a pointer. If I'm actually getting that div, this actually stores that div. The document has. The browser has gone and gotten that there and it's given it back to my code. Now this is where you guys have it over old people like me. Because these days with object-oriented programming so common, it's just natural when you say, well I'm gonna call us, I'm gonna call a library routine and it's gonna give me back an object and then I'm just gonna work on that object. And you can just say, okay, that's how it works. An old guy like me thinks, well, how does that work? Uh, do they convert it to a number? Is it a pointer? How does that work? Blah, 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 blah. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. If you go look at the description of this, it says it gets an element. You think, okay, I got an element. What the heck? I don't know what that means, but it's an element. So now I got an element in my output area. I'll do something with that element. I know how to do things with elements. Here's how I'm going to do something to it. I'm going to do two things. One, I'm going to change the color of that element, and I'm going to change the HTML inside that element. I do that a little bit down here. 
So one of the things that I get when I call this routine, if you go look at its documentation, is I find out whether the customer pressed the uh, true button or the false button. Now, if the true, when I would say true button, what I really mean is the OK button. And when this routine returns false, it means they click the cancel button. So now I know how to get input from the customer. By calling this library routine, I give the customer an option of two buttons. They click on one of them, and I can tell which of the two buttons they've got. And depending on which one I get, either the button they pressed was OK or the button was canceled. If the button was OK, this is an if statement, remember, conditional. If the conditional is true, then I'm going to do this code. If the conditional is false, I'm going to do this code. And what's going to be different? I'm going to take that element from the document. I'm going to change its style. And I'm going to make the background different. Probably going to use six things here, which when you take, if you take 133J introduction to JavaScript, you'll spend all semester going, all quarter going through these elements. So this is a real whirlwind tour. If some of this stuff is bouncing on, don't worry about it. This is called chaining. Chaining. These are all methods. So here I've got an element. It's an object. I can call its method. Here's one of its methods. That's a method that changes the style of an element. Here's another of its methods. That method is kind of simple, because it looks not like I'm just assigning it to it. That's called an accessor. All that method does is it says, you can set a variable. Remember, objects have variables and method. So here, I'm taking an object, an element on a page, changing the style, and I'm setting one of its attributes to a new value. This is exactly the same thing that you do when you make a CSS rule. If you have a CSS rule, you're saying, well, if you find this element, either by its element type, or its ID, or its class, or remember those pseudo selectors, you know, an anchor that's in a hover mode. It's the same thing you do with the rule. You're just saying, I'm going to want to make the best, this color change, or I'm going to want to make it a border, or whatever it is. This is how you do exactly the same thing in a piece of JavaScript, in a piece of code. So there, I've changed the style slightly in something based on a, a user's input. Now I'm going to take that same element, the output area div, and I'm going to change its HTML. I'm going to change what's on the and I'm going to use a method called inner HTML. It's inner HTML because it's the HTML between the two tags, between the two containers. So I'm just going to feed that div some new HTML using it here. And just like we saw on Tuesday, I'm going to have a little bit of text with a P tag in it. Then I'm going to concatenate the value of the button. Remember, I got the button from the result of that dialog. So, what's going to happen? First, I'm going to pop up a dialog box. I'm going to ask the customer a question. Press a button and watch the output area. I'm going to read their result. I'm going to find out which button they, they pressed. I'm going to test that result. Is it true or false? Depending on whether it's true or false, I'm going to set a variable, I'm going to change a style, and then I'm going to output some HTML. Yeah. So with the variables, you, you don't have to assign what it's going to store like you do with... Okay. I, I can, it's JavaScript. It's like a scripting language. It's very loosely tight. I don't care what I'm going to put. Uh, the word we used on Tuesday was it's duct typing. It looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. So this thing looks like a string, it's going to be a string. But frankly, it doesn't matter. If I put a number in there, when it got to this thing, it knows it needs a string here, it would automatically convert to a number, uh, a number to a string. It, you don't need to cast. That's what you're used to. Java will run C. 
Okay, and then finally, I'm just not done calling libraries. I love calling libraries, because why not? I'm going to actually call another library here. I'll call it an alert. So I have one, a confirm, another library call, I have another library call, another library call, yet another library call, and yet another library call. So the takeaway here is that in most programming, you are constantly calling other people's code. You are constantly calling other people's code, and so you have to get good at learning how other people's code works. And there's lots of places where you can learn that. And in a really smart editor, in a really smart editor in an uh, ID, uh, integrated development environment, you can just right mouse click on the thing itself and say, tell me about this. And it'll bring up the documentation for you. So if you want to be a programmer, you really don't write a lot of code. There's maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, 12, about a dozen lines of code here. But each one of these, hundreds of lines of code. What's going on inside this whole thing is a hundred lines of somebody else's code. And I'm just skating along the surface doing the little things that I find important. All right, let's go see this thing in action. Here's that button that was wired up to my JavaScript function. When I click this function, I'm, when I click this button, I'm going to call that function. The first thing is I get that confirmation dialog box. It's called a confirmation dialog because it gives you, it's basically that annoying choice of, here's a horrible thing, okay, and you have to say okay or not. We don't like either response, but you typically click it okay. So here's that confirmation dialog box. If I click this, I'll get true. If I click this, I'll get false. Let's click false first. So I'm going to click cancel. It went through. It changed the color. It changed the HTML. And it popped up this alert. When I click the alert, you can see now my background has changed, changed color. It went from a horrible gray to a putrid pink. And now it's saying this is the button I click. If I do it again, it changes to green. Earth shaking functionality. I'm going to be a billionaire if I just ship this product. I know. In any case, you can do other stuff. You can take the output of a form, the string. Put that in dialog boxes. You can put that in an HTML form or in an HTML page. Now, in terms of your extra credit, if you wanted to, in your extra credit homework, you have to take a look and have it appear on the page. So, where would I go to? to replace this output with a loop. Any ideas? Any ideas at all? Where does this output come from? It comes from a function in the JavaScript code. It comes from here. So if I wanted to replace this with a simple output of a loop, like your assignment asks you to do, I just cut all of this out and I replace it with And in fact, in the assignment, well, it's pretty simple if you've done this a hundred times before. In the assignment, it gives you some background. It says, well, this is, let's build this up a little bit. It says, this is, oh, we looked at this on Tuesday. Actually, wait. It says, this is a loop. Here's the for loop. Here's that document write column. It says, okay, so why don't you put that in a function? So I put it in a function. There's my function, there's my parentheses, there's my open bracket, and my closed bracket. And I just put the loop inside. And I put it in a black box and I can use that anywhere I like to. 
Then we go back to that idea of, well, I've got a button on the page. I can take this button and I can wire it up to my function. So I just defined a function. Now I'm going to wire it to a button. So that whenever I click that button, I call that function. So just like this. Here's my input type, and it's connected to that loop and display. And then it goes through the same thing we just talked about, how you can name a block of text this. You can get the element by the ID. So you can tell your program, go get that element. I want to change it. And then it talks about the inner HTML that allows you to change the contents of the page. So with these three pieces, functions, buttons, and then uh, the element ID and the libraries, the functions, the buttons, and the libraries, you can um, do all three things that you need to do to get those 20 points that you want. Again, this is all, um, here's actually some example code if you want to work through it. Now, as I said, you can't turn this in for credit. I'm sorry. <coughs> You'll have to make it your own. But frankly, you don't have to go very far. But let's review. In every programming situation, in every programming situation, you've got those parts. You've got the language. As we saw in the last two weeks, different programming languages are starting similar qualities and some of them are different. So JavaScript is an example of a functional language that has object-oriented properties. You've got the language. Then you've got the libraries. Every programming language has a bunch of libraries that somebody else has given you. And you need to learn how to, how to learn that. You need to be able to go into those things quickly and find what you need. Here, the uh, documentation can help you. Uh, Google is your friend. And then there is a place called Stack Overflow. Com, where there's very helpful programmers sitting around saying, hi, I can help you out. Yes, sir. Is there any good IDEs for that work with the, the JavaScript that allows for uh, IntelliSense? Well, uh, Visual Studio is pretty good to work with. So if you're a Microsoft coder and you're using uh, you can use Visual Studio for JavaScript. Um, open source, uh, I tend to use something called uh, RubyMine, which is a variation of IntelliJ. Uh, Eclipse is a little quirky, but it's it's a big ID open source. ID. Ruby Mind doesn't have the dot extensions for you though. When you hit the dot, you can list it. Mm -hmm. I have that too. And then one I really like, but it's not, there's a couple that I really like that are not free. One is called Komodo by Active State. It's 99 bucks. But it's it's real clean. It doesn't have a lot of stuff and it fits my brain better. The thing you need to do with, and this brings up the third thing you always do, is you've always got tools. There's the three aspects of programming. And which IDE you use, sometimes it's a personal choice because some IDEs fit your way of thinking better than others. 
But sometimes it's not really any choice at all. If you're in a Microsoft house, a lot of companies do Microsoft development, you use Visual Studio. It is an excellent tool. It's not free. There's a version of it that is free. And I would recommend to any one of you who is interested in a career in computers is you get familiar with Visual Studio. It's a really dominant player in the marketplace. We get it for free. Pardon me? We get it from the... Oh, you guys get it free because you're students. Yeah. If you're, a, if you're a professional, it's really worth your while to buy the uh, MSDA subscription. If you're a professional programmer, yeah, it's a thousand bucks a year, but you get every piece of Microsoft software for free. Yeah, well, with included. So if you work for a good uh, company that knows what they're talking about, they'll get you an MSDA subscription. You just get access. The thing, when you get on board with a, an environment like that, like with Microsoft, is you have to stay current. And MSDN is, a, is the Microsoft Developer Network. It's a beautiful, beautiful set of, of documentation, training, tools, and software. It's a wonderful thing, and other companies try to imitate it. Sun has something similar in the Java realm. Uh, another ID that's really good for Java is uh, NetBeans. I think that's free. I think they use Blue Jake here. Some people like some people don't. But for JavaScript, frankly, you can go a long way with Notepad++ and Firebug. The editor, as we've already seen, helps you understand the language by highlighting and syntax coloring, and then a debugger. Now, the other nice thing is that you guys are coming at this fresh. So if you walk into a shop and some crusty old guy says, ah, I don't need no stinking debuggers, printouts are good enough for me and my granddad, tell him, fine, good, enjoy your life, get me a debugger. I don't want to sit around waiting while you, while I spent 20 years getting as good as you are, when I can do it this afternoon with the debugger. I've met a lot of old dogs who refuse to learn this new trick. It's incredibly stupid of them. But Like we said, get something that gets you to the documentation of that. And all of these together go into an ID. And it is worth your time. You will spend as much time learning this piece as you do this piece. You'll spend as much time learning this piece as you do this piece. We used to think that when you learned a language, you spend all your time here. And if, and if you had to spend any time on here, then that was wrong. That's where these old dogs are coming from. I don't want to learn anything down here. But think of it differently. Think of it as a triangle. And you need to have all three parts to get good at this. All right. That's my ranting soapbox for today. And that's the last one of this whole course. Thank you for putting it up with me. So at this point, I'm done. We'll remind you of the deadlines. You've got assignment six due Sunday night. Sunday night. Quiz seven is available, but it's just practice. It'll help you see some of the quiz, uh, some of the questions that will be on the final. The final is next Tuesday. Final is next Tuesday. It can be taken online. It'll open up at three. You'll get two shots at it. It's the same size as the midterm. It will cover from the midterm to today. It won't cover what we just showed you there, but it's too much. You have two opportunities for extra credit. You must choose one of them, or neither. If you're looking at the grade you want, you don't have to do any extra credit at all. If you want some extra points, that's what they're there for. Pick one of them. Send it to me by Wednesday at midnight. This is important. I cannot accept any homework from you after Wednesday at midnight. So even if you turn in something Sunday and it's got problems and we start the usual cycle of, well, can you fix this? And we'll work on that. That whole thing has to finish up by Wednesday night. You have to have all your extra credit stuff in by Wednesday night. So get the, if you want to do the extra credit, toss it at me early so we can go around the block.
The final, I've seen um, students able to take two shots at the final and, um, in one class period. So the final should take you, well, take some people about an hour. I've seen some. Oh, be available 24 hours. 24 hours? Yeah. Yep. So from Tuesday at 3 to Wednesday at 3. Okay. So frankly, at Wednesday, whenever you take the final, you'll know what your final grade is going to be because I will make sure that I have graded all of the homework by Tuesday night. So Wednesday, you'll know what the situation is. And then I've got a bunch of paperwork I've got to turn So you guys can get your money and move on to the next day. It's been a pleasure having you guys in class. Yeah. Me neither. Okay, go.